Okay, um, a very good morning to all of you here. Um, I do believe we have uh, 41 participants on this uh, ethics primer for engineers. It's the first time that the institution is trying to reach out to our members to have this uh, interface. Uh, we all know that as a result of the restrictions put in place by the government regarding the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are expected to observe these uh, protocols. And as a result of that, the institution has decided to migrate a lot of our seminars, lectures onto online platforms such as this one. And uh, we, uh, we hope that we can get some more members engaged and have discussions today. Today's uh, presentation will be done by Professor Sam Uswa Bebio. I believe all of you have already downloaded the two modules, so you know a bit about him. Um, he's a civil engineer, he's a lecturer at the University of Wisconsin in the United States. Uh, he's currently on sabbatical leave working with the GHIE to spruce up our training modules, our CPD delivery and other, among other things he's doing. And then he has uh, kindly uh, obliged to deliver this uh, presentation this morning. So on behalf of the Council of the Ghana Institution of Engineering, the President of Engineer Alexaye, and myself, the Executive Director of Nigeria Japan. I want to welcome all of you, and I'll give the space now to Sam to start um, the presentation. Over to you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Japan. It's my pleasure to be here to uh, study with all of you. Uh, like you said, I'm a oh, oh. at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Plaville. Very okay. good teach uh, ethics as part of a capstone, you know, design course to students, and I'm also a part of uh, a consortium of faculty members across the United States that promote science, technology, engineering, and math uh, to undergraduate students and then to high school students. And one of the areas that we identify is in the area of infrastructure. So every year we do have, what's going on here? Yeah. Every year we do have a few faculty uh, go on a boot camp. And on the boot camp, you're supposed to be delivering or developing. A course within three days. Very complicated. Everybody gets a topic and then you deliver that. And that is where the center of infrastructure transformation and education, you know, comes in. And I usually develop the ethics component, you know, for that uh, group. Uh, aside that, I'm also a member of the ASCE and a registered professional engineer. And I currently work for uh, the Department of Transportation in the state of uh, Excuse me, if you're not talking, you might want to mute your mic so everybody can, you know, we, we can have some. Okay. So just, just having some technical okay. difficulty here. We, we, we the, host, the host mutes everybody. Okay, I've muted. Yeah, okay. I've, I've muted it. Okay, you have. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yeah, we just want to start our ethics primer for engineers. And we have four modules actually. This is module one, which is going to be looking at member perceptions about GHIE regarding ethics. And I just want us to go right to it because you did have the opportunity to download. And so you have gone through it. We might want to speed up so we can dedicate uh, part of the time to actually have a discussion. Now a little background to this ethics primer series. I think back in 2018, there was an infrastructure conference uh, at the Holiday Inn. It was organized by the 
Ghana Transportation Professionals Forum uh, in partnership with the GHIE and then the Transport uh, Research uh, Education Center at KNUST. And at one of the conference sessions, we had a, uh, a discussion on ethics. And I think at the end of the discussion, we all realized that there's a need to do more in this area. And so the executive director indicated his commitment to improving the ethics culture uh, within the professional body. That's why we have this series uh, going. So today we will look at modules one and two, and then at another time, we will look at uh, module three, which will actually introduce us to some fundamentals uh, in the area of ethics. And then uh, the last module, probably we will look at why people with good intentions and are making poor ethical choices. That will be module four, which will come at another date. Now let's get started here with the outcomes. The outcome, basically, what are you expected to gain after going through this uh, series? We will look at online survey, data analysis, summarize, and then we will provide some uh, recommendations. Okay, so at the end of the presentation, I expect that you have some idea in relation to uh, the barriers uh, to addressing ethical issues in the profession. And then we also look at how can we describe member perceptions about GHIE operations in relation to ethics? And then what steps can we take uh, to promote ethics within the profession? Okay, like I said before, uh, the ED wanted to have uh, a hold in terms of what is the status uh, with membership knowledge when it comes to ethics. So we worked together to develop a 33 question survey uh, that focused on uh, practitioners' perception about GHIE operations in relation to ethics. And then the professionals own experience and observations about workplace ethics. We put this out there uh, from mid-September to uh, mid-October. So that's roughly about four weeks. And then we had uh, only about 188 respondents out of an active membership of at least 4,000. So this represents less than 5% of membership that participated. And to me, this is a little bit you know, disappointing. We hope to uh, address that at some point. Now, if we will look at the profile of the participants, just a second here. Okay, we will look at, is there any way that I can get this one? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so if we will look at the profile of the participants, we realize that the bulk of the participants are civil engineering uh, people, and then we do have electrical and electronic engineering also in there. And then we do also have mechanical engineering. So those people who participated in the survey, predominantly civil, mechanical, and then electrical and electronic engineering. Then if we will look at it by sex, we realize that the predominant course, male about 92%, and then uh, female about 8%. If we will break it down by age group, uh, we do have uh, 31 to 35 uh, age group, 36 to 40, and then 26 to 30 year age group, they form the bulk of it. But it looks like we do have representation from uh, all age groups. Now, if you look at it by years of professional experience, then we have I think about a quarter of the participants, they have experienced at least 20 years, and then about 30% uh, between five and 10 years, and then uh, about 21%, in this case, they have uh, between 10 and 15 years of uh, professional experience. So this is well distributed across professional uh, experience groups. And then if you will look at it by membership rank, 
we see that the bulk of the participants are in a professional engineer uh, rank, followed by trainee professional uh, engineer. And then we do have the other uh, ranks also represented. Now let's get to the substance of the survey. A question was asked, do you agree that engineers must always be ethical in the practice of their profession? And so if you're looking at the screen on the vertical axis, we have percent of total respondents. And then this is broken into male and uh, female. And then we realize that the green is yes. Those who believe that engineers must always be ethical in the practice of their uh, profession. So overwhelmingly, nearly 100% agree that engineers must always be ethical in the practice of yeah, that was, uh, Now, the next question was based on your own experience or observations. Do you think engineers are ethical in the practice of their profession? Uh, in this case, we didn't have a binary choice answer yes or no, but we do have a range of uh, responses uh, from not ethical, less ethical, uh, somewhat ethical to uh, ethical. Uh, if you look at the results, if you had asked a simple yes or no uh, choice, then chances are you're going to have people who may have some reservations or concerns about ethical issues uh, within the organization, but not feel comfortable at the same time trying to protect, you know, the image of the institution. So they will have answered uh, yes. So once you give this range of responses, then it's easy to be able to detect, you know, those people who might have reservations. In my opinion, there's no such thing as less ethical, somewhat ethical. You either ethical or not ethical. So if we are looking at this result, the only thing that matters here is a dark green. So if we will take this dark green bar and then uh, put it on top of the one here, then all we can say is only about 20% of respondents uh, think that engineers are actually uh, ethical in the practice of their profession. If we will look at it by professional rank, then the 20% that we saw from the previous slide, actually the bulk of it is for the professional engineers and the rest uh, trainee professional engineer. And then it cuts across the other uh, ranks, but the bulk of it is for the professional engineers. Now a question was asked, do you own a copy of the GHIE code of ethics? Uh, when we were developing the uh, survey, I got the understanding that the GHIE code of ethics usually is given to members when they are first uh, being inducted into the uh, profession. And so everyone is supposed to have a copy. But here, if you look at the results, there are 15%. In this case, I'm looking at the male component and then the female component. If you add both together, we have 15% of uh, members who do not own copies of the GHIE Code of Ethics. Then the question becomes, did they fail to pick it up uh, when they were being inducted into the program or uh, they lost them? That is something that I have no idea. Now, if you uh, look at those who possess a copy of the GHIE Code of Ethics, okay, the bulk of those who did not or do not is just in the professional engineer you know, rank and then senior professional engineer ranks. And then if you possess a copy of the GHIE Code of Ethics, the question was, when was the last time you referenced it or you read it? And in this case, we noticed that about 
four percent if we will take this here and then mount it on this red bar about four percent of members actually have never referenced or read the code of ethics you know before and from the previous slide those who have not read it uh they represent the professional engineer you know rank okay that four percent even if it's eight members and they haven't referenced it that is a problem <clears throat> then the question was asked if you do not have a copy of the code of ethics do you know where to get a copy of it okay we have about 28 members who didn't have copies of the GHIE code of ethics and out of those if we break it by percentage we have about let's see here 39.5 and then 3.5 roughly we have uh 43 percent okay who do not have copies but they know where to get a copy and then you do also have those who do not own copies, but they are aware of the existence of such a code. Then the question is, if they know where to get it, or they are aware of existence of the code, why aren't they getting it? Don't they have any interest in wanting to know what the organization stands for? I have no idea. Then the more troubling situation is for those who indicate that they don't have copies and they're actually not aware of the existence of such a code. And to me, that is a little bit you know, troubling to be part of such a prestigious you know, institution and then not knowing what the institution stands for. That's something that uh, needs uh, some attention there. Then the next question was, do you know the procedure for filing a complaint with the GHIE when you observe any ethical misconduct or a violation of the GHIE code of ethics by another member of the institution? Surprisingly, if you put these red bars uh, together, we have 57% here plus seven. So 64, more than half of members do not have a clue as to how to file an ethical complaint. And that's something that also needs attention. Uh, you take the same question and you break it down. Uh, the bulk of them are the professional engineer rank and then the trainee professional engineer uh, rank. Then the next question was to the best of your knowledge, do you know of a case where the GHIE has taken a disciplinary action against a violator of the GHIE code of ethics? And if we will put the red bars together, we have 79.5 and then 8.5 here. That tells us that uh, about 88% have no idea whether any disciplinary case uh, has been uh, filed against any violator of the code of ethics. And then the question was, when was the last time you had a formal or informal training or attended an event dealing with ethics? Surprisingly, 41%, we're looking at 36 and a five year, they have never uh, received training or attended an event on ethics. Uh, that is also something that needs a, a serious attention because we've been talking about ethical issues uh, all the time and here we are as a profession and the majority of our members have never attended any ethics event 
that's something that needs some serious attention. And then if you break that down by a rank, you notice that a bulk of it in the professional engineer rank or trainee professional engineer rank. And then we also wanted to look at, just based on your opinion, can you indicate your level of agreement with the following statement that the GHIE has done a good job educating its members about professional engineering ethics? Uh, we look at the results, I think it's mixed, but if we will look at a dark green, that tells us that only about 20% of members uh, agree or strongly agree that the GHIE has done uh, a good job when it comes to ethics training and education. Uh, surprisingly, I'm looking at uh, the previous slide where we noticed that 41% never attended any event. So I was expecting that they will be in the uh, strongly disagree column, but somehow I don't see how that is reflected you know, in this uh, result. So now we look at the summary of the findings. We notice that while members overwhelmingly agree that engineering practitioners must be ethical in their professional practice, only about 20% uh, of respondents think engineers are actually ethical when it comes to uh, the practice of their profession. Then we have approximately 15% of members do not own copies of the GHIE Code of Ethics. 10% uh, of those represent members at the professional engineer rank. Uh, nearly 4% of members who own copies of the GHIE Code of Ethics have never read or referenced it before. And then for our uh, 28 members who do not own copies of the code, uh, about 57%. They don't know where to obtain copies. And that is a little bit uh, troubling because you are a member of a professional body. The professional body has values, missions, and you indicate that you have no idea where to get a you know, copy of the code of ethics to learn about the values and uh, missions or ethical uh, stuff in relation to the organization. I think that's a little bit odd. Now, as we continue, 64% of members don't know the procedure for filing ethical complaints. And then we're talking about nearly 90% of members not aware of any disciplinary cases brought against violators of the institution's code of ethics. 41% never received any training or attended event dealing with ethics. And then one in five strongly agree that the institution has done a good job regarding ethics, education, and training. Okay, so with all that said, the findings, what can we do to improve? Okay, then the first uh, recommendation or suggestion is for us to include the GHIE Code of Ethics, uh, the website, I think for easy access uh, by members and any other interest groups. Okay, this is standard you know, practice for uh, all professional you know, bodies. And then we also have to recognize that even though we have the Code of Ethics to govern our professional conduct as an institution, we have to realize that there are other people who might also be interested in looking at what the institution stands for. You can have people coming from outside investors or uh, foreign engineering consultants. They want to come in and then do work you know, in Ghana. At least one of the places that they will check is to go to the institution's uh, website, look at the code of ethics to see how, when, what, how they can relate to their counterparts if they come in here to do work. I recall prior to COVID-19, there was some discussion uh, about having maybe some sort of 
uh, a year of return for science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, professionals. That is something, you know, uh, that we're being discussed, okay, out there. And so if you're gonna have people like that, you know, come in uh, for a year of return, I think these are professionals, they will want to know something about what the institution stands for and then how they can relate uh, when they come in here to uh, practice engineering. And then we can provide, you know, direct guidance through the GHIE a website regarding ethics complaint filing process. I know at the present time, if you look at the code of ethics, it's embedded somewhere in a descriptive, you know, uh, format, and it's a little bit uh, hidden. So here, if we can provide a direct link, then uh, that will be uh, fairly straightforward. I think I do have a copy that I will show. Uh, I just drafted that, that I will show on the screen. And then we also have to look at uh, increasing training sessions on ethics to better equip members in ethical decision uh, making. Okay, if you were at the 2018 uh, conference session, I think it wasn't uh, that good when we went through that uh, discussion. That's why we're holding this one. But if we can have more training, then we exposing our members to uh, ethical situations and then helping them to know how do they address it when they are confronted with it. Or if they are in a situation where they have to give an advice to uh, peers or junior members who are exposed to uh, ethical issues. Then uh, the fourth thing that we can consider is uh, find ways to generate member interest in matters pertaining to professional growth. I think that low level of participation in the survey, uh, for example, limits uh, the institution's ability to uh, comprehensively evaluate and address institutional and ethical issues. I think this is an institution that belongs to all the engineers. So if we have to make decisions, we want a collective you know, participation from all members so that when something is put out there, uh, we can all be proud of it and say we all contributed, you know, to it. So I think that's uh, something that needs to be looked at. And then uh, the fifth one, okay, we did, <laughs> if you look at the survey, we had about 90% who indicated that they do not know of a case where the GHIE uh, has taken measures or actions against violator of uh, the code of ethics. So what we're saying is, well, is it possible that we can publish all adjudicated ethical cases at this website to enhance transparency? and discourage members from unethical uh, practices. This may sound, you know, radical, but if we want to effect, you know, a change, then sometimes we have to do things differently. We cannot continue to do uh, the same things over and over again and then expect, you know, different results. It doesn't, you know, work that way. And then uh, the last point there is for us to be able to stress the importance of the code of ethics to members. We realize that some members are not even referencing it or have a clue uh, as to how the process works. If they have to file an ethics complaint, all of them are embedded within the code. So if we can have uh, members do that, we, if we can stress the importance of the code of ethics to members, then that's something that will be helpful for the future. Okay, so at this point, I am just going to uh, open the floor for questions in relation to 
module one. And then probably we will look at, for example, I put out there, stress the importance of code of ethics to members. I mean, how do we do that? And then I also want your comments in relation to us publishing or adjudicated cases uh, online. Okay, let's just see here, um, stop share. Okay, now questions. Any comments? Any? What are your thoughts with some of the uh, proposals being made here? I've raised my hand. Okay. Uh, who is that uh, Richard? This is Theo. Theo Nino Theo. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good to to hear and see you. Um, this is a first. Sure. Uh, for HIE, and uh, I think it's excellent. It's, it's actually the way to go. Um, we, we, from my organization, we've been using uh, Zoom for our meetings uh, and we've, we've been productive even with the current COVID-19 situation. So I really want to congratulate you and the ED and the institution uh, for doing this. Uh, the content is excellent. I'm looking forward to the next module. And so I just want to say congratulations and, and thank you. You're welcome. Any comment on the content? I think those are big issues. I mean, if you are not used to, uh, I know how the culture is, you're going to be putting information out there on a site for the entire world to see who is uh, supposedly a violating code of ethics. Is that something that you're comfortable with? I think I want some comments there. How do you feel about that? If we were to publish all the adjudicated cases, uh, to me, it's a good thing. It's not uncommon. You go to the Western world, that's what you know we do. And the material that you have there, they form a source of uh, case studies so that during maybe your training sessions, you can take material like that and then expose your members to, so that they will not fall into a trap of committing, maybe, uh, or violating a similar uh, situation. So I think so, something, yes. So I think uh, Robert Bellwell's hand has been up for a while, if you can give him the permission. <laughs> oh, okay, I see here. So Robert, Robert Bill, I think I saw his hand up. Um, okay. So Robert, if you can unmute, Robert is right at the top. You can unmute his mic for him and then he can speak. Where's Robert here? Let's see here. Um, well, in his absence, maybe you can allow Edmond Kwesi Debra to speak. You can unmute. Um, if you want to raise your hand, there's a feature underneath the participants, <laughs> okay. and then if you click it, your hand will show. I think your hand will show yeah, to the. Um, I think Kwesi is uh, the one that uh, can comment or ask a question. Now. Oh, Deborah. Okay, now. Yeah, Edmund. Yes. yes, yes. Yeah, hi, Ed. Okay, okay. Good to have you, um, Prof. Um, I think the idea of we publishing the educated cases on the website is in the right direction. What I think we can do is that 
instead of we capturing names and then exactly. names of pers personalities and then names of let's say institutions we can give them certain codes so that readers will not necessarily identify these personalities and then these places but then the the import or the substance of the educated cases could be there that members when read would inform us what exactly is happening and as you captured in your um, recommendations it will also serve as a deterrent to, to other professional um, uh, discharges that we have in the body so that is my little take on that one so <laughs> you don't want maybe a name to be associated with uh, a case yeah. exactly we, uh, we we can well then that, we can that, give seven codes that defeats the whole purpose because you want to the people to not move in that direction I think this is one of the things that I try to use. You know, uh, I go to pick up cases, bring them to the classroom. And then once you're going through that with students, you have the name there and then you ask students. Okay. How do you feel about your dad's name being posted out there? Or your name being posted out there in the future? Nobody wants to do that. And I think that's a powerful mm -hmm. thing to have your name there and in that case, people get terrified. They don't want to have their names there. But if you're going to go in a direction where you want to cover you know, the name, then I don't think it will actually have the maximum impact that you want to have. <laughs> yeah, because if, let's say, you have one name there, okay, everybody knows, oh, okay, this is engineer X with license number this, this is the case. Nobody wants to, you know, move in that direction. So you want to be more uh, ethical, such that at least your name can appear there. That's my, you know, thought. And if uh, in the US, that of the time, they are published. Sam, I think uh, uh, President-elect uh, Professor Charles Adams has his hand up, if you can allow him to speak. Uh, let's see here. So if you can unmute his phone that, for him. That, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I have a helmet here. So you see Charles iPhone. I think that's yeah. Oh, okay, Charles iPhone. Yeah, you have a mute. Him. Yeah, hi, John. Can you unmute him then? Yeah, that's fine. Hi, Charles. Uh oh. Charles, yeah, he's on now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Prof, for a very nice uh, presentation. Very good uh, facts and um, well presented. Fine recommendations, and I think uh, it's uh, it's a lot of meat there. A lot of things to chew on. Yeah. Uh, just mm -hmm. one small comment to start with sure. concerning what you just said about uh, putting things online. I think we should be careful to uh, put things online that could, uh, could take the institution into a legal tussle. Mm -hmm. I think I need to go through the full hall of uh, adjudication by competent uh, court of jurisdiction and follow due process before, when it becomes public, because what you alluded to in the US and in many places, when it has gone through the full Hall and it's made public, you can put it online. Not until that is done, it will create a complicated institution, institutional bottleneck, and we don't want to have that. Um, so the recommendation is fine. If people are caught doing corrupt acts and they are going through the courts and everything, and they are our members, and we think that it is news and we say that these guys they are members they can be used to teach other people but not until then we don't want to get into any complex uh, situation with the law otherwise we will get into too many things that we are not uh, ready for yeah. the second 
the second question that I have mm -hmm. is that um, this is a very limited study. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to treat the recommendations with caution. Because, uh, for example, when you design a stated preference questionnaire, which is what you have done, you have uh, designed a questionnaire or a questionnaire that has been designed. I was one of the people that filled the questionnaire. And I think that the responses must be interpreted carefully. For example, when you ask somebody, where do you, where do you think you can get, or do you know where to get GHIE ethics material? Their mind may not come on the institution. So usually, you will ask another question, or another question, or another question. Because we all know in this country, if you want to buy anything, you go to Ghana Publishing. So if you ask people things that are very general in a certain sense, and there's no additional question to clarify whether they know that they could get it from the institution, when you are interpreting, you've got to be a little careful because it can lead us into you know that that's one of the reasons why these social science based studies are usually people say they are subjective is because if you ask one question and then people get it and there is no other question to explain or to verify you may make a recommendation that may suggest something but it may not be exactly the case so i would say that good presentation good points, good pointers to what we must do, and also uh, good recommendations because actually the recommendation about training, I think, is key because ethical conduct must be taught and must be taught and must be taught and must be taught and must be taught as many times as we need to hear till we all learn something from it. So I think that your recommendations about training, about uh, even uh, if we had had cases, we just indicating the list of cases that we have dealt with and putting the, the scenario on the, on the website is enough without any names. That so so and so was on a broad project, he did this thing, he's just investigated, he was this, but he's going through due process in the court. That is enough for now. Um, all the other things, until they are finished in the court of competent jurisdiction, they will ill advise to put them on the website. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Charles, uh, going back to publishing those names at the institution's website, I think not all cases go through the court system because you have a professional body, the ethics committee, that will go through a situation like that. And so from their perspective, they are also going through adjudication you know, process. So this is where that comes in. So this one here, you want to make it clear, maybe in your uh, bylaws or whatever, and then indicate that all cases, uh, once they're completed, they are published at the site. There were extreme cases where you get involved in a court, but Noble situations, this is part of the group. This is how we discipline our uh, members when they violate you know, the code of ethics. So in the US, for example, all that I'm talking about, some of them end up in a court system. Others, they are just educated by the ethics committee. And that's what is published out there. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. so that's- All right, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, that's where- yeah. yeah, and then I think the only thing that I would say is that you know, in the, in the university, mm -hmm. we have our own statutes, sure. So, anything that is dealt with and recorded in the statutes can be published on the website. I think that's what you are saying, yeah. So, so once you are part of the body, we will have our statutes, that's correct. And our if our statutes indicate that when you go through the legal system. Sure. It will appear in that document. Mm -hmm. Then that document will remain available on the website, and it is, and it's registered and uh, at the government registry, and it's like a hansard, like the way we have the parliamentary hansard. And 
uh, lawyers will be involved in this whole process. So that once it enters that one, then it can be used. Then that one, I agree with it. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Thank and you. then I think for uh, the question regarding uh, the ethics, you uh, indicated that people can just go get ethics information. But I think this one, the survey specifically asked whether they have the GHIE code of ethics. Because like I indicated at the beginning, when members are being uh, inducted into the professional body, that's when they receive the code of ethics. So I think this one was much more specific to that code. And you will expect that uh, people will have access you know, to it. And I think for us to be able to publish that code online, I think that one, I don't see a problem with it. But that's, a, that's a good idea. But um, my surprise is that Mm -hmm. People who are joining the institution are given the code of ethics. So even by checking the records, if let's say you interview 200 people and 100 people are institutional members, and then they said they don't have it, it shows that the record, the, the, the questionnaire survey is not correct. But if our records show that we gave 100 people and these 100 people were interviewed and they have forgotten that they received it, then interpreting that they don't have it is not correct. Because we know they have it. Whether they read it is another matter. So what I'm saying that mm -hmm. asking people a question like that, you, you, you need to look at it. Because if you check, oh, when you join the institution, maybe previously we're not doing that. Now we are doing that. Okay. So if you check when they join, you will notice that maybe all the people who have it, they join from a certain time. It will give you a different recommendation from saying that, People have joined and they don't have it. Because I know that everyone who joined from a certain time mm -hmm. is handed a copy of that. So they must have it because we have given it to them. Whether they read it or use it is another story. Yeah, I understand. But, you know, do they have to pay? Um, so, um, because there are a lot of hands that have been raised, can you please allow now, uh, oh, okay. Engineer Amudio Du? Yeah, I have my um, Sorry about that. Hello, good afternoon, Prof. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. In fact, most of the issues I wanted to address, the last speaker has actually done justice to them all. Sure. So the only thing I want to add is that um, I think there should be more training as far as ethics are concerned, because um, most of the time, you know, there are training going on at the uh, head office in Accra. And most of the engineers are found in uh, Tamale, Sunyane, and every part of the country. And people are not getting the opportunity to attend because of the distance. So I would actually suggest that from nine onwards, maybe you could have a lot of training online, Zoom platform, and any other useful platform that will enable members across the country to have access to training programs such as this. So I think this is a very good move. And I thank the organizers and then the, the board members for that. Your point is well noted. Thank you. And then the next one, Engineer Amodudu. Oh, Neo. Yeah, I just. I think uh, Engineer Okai has had an opportunity. So maybe we'll pass it on to Engineer uh, Robert Beua. If he's on line. Hi, Prof. Good afternoon. How are you? Pretty good. How about you? Great, I'm doing well. Thanks. Um, I would want to say thank you to the um, GHI leadership for, for this training. Um, like um, the engineer who spoke earlier mentioned, we really need more of these because we are all not in Accra and spread across um, various parts of the country and the world. So if, if we move most of these sessions online, then it affords everyone the opportunity to to join and benefit from the sessions that GHI con uh, conducts. Um, I really have appreciated this session and it's very good that um, a lot of awareness is, is being created within the GHIE on ethics because that's what we need, in my personal opinion, as engineers to, to make a difference in society. And personally, I also see it as a business advantage that if, if you are an engineer and you are ethical, then obviously, naturally, people would want to deal with you. So whatever... Um, endeavor that you are in that can can bring you more business that you're doing it's also good that um, cases that have been adjudged and if possible have gone through the legal system um, be 
be put on the website. Like Prof. Uragi mentioned, that can be used as case studies. It can be used as reference points. That can also be a guidance just in case subsequently any engineer in the near future finds himself or herself in a similar situation. Um, he can pick lessons from some of these cases. And I'm also very happy that um, there is a proposal to, to um, provide a link on the GHI website where um, cases of misconduct can be reported. I believe this will go a long way to afford even people who are not members of GHIE, whenever they observe or they experience any, any misconduct on the part of a me uh, member, it will afford them the opportunity to be able to report um, such cases for investigation. So thanks for the, for the, for the time and thanks for, for the knowledge that you passed on this afternoon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the next person. Yes, Sam, I think you can look at Mimi. I mean, I, I hope it's a lady who wants to be gender sensitive, but there's a Mimi. Um, that's the only name you can see. So yeah, hi, Mimi. I, I mute her. I hope yeah. there's a head. Yeah. Uh, hello. Mimi? Yeah, unfortunately, it is, I'm using the name Mimi, but it's not a, it's not a female. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm also sorry about that. My name, my name is actually Vincent Aqua. Okay. Okay, good. There are two things I just want to raise. Um, in your, in your survey, you said that a certain percentage said that the engineer must not always be ethical. Must always and be ethical. Must not. A certain no, percentage. No, no, the yeah. question was whether based on their observation and experiences, whether they think that's what, what that was the question. They All right. Because if, you, if I look at that particular slide, um, I've forgotten the number, but the heading is engineers must always be ethical. No, in the, their practice. Yeah, the first question was, if you do you believe that engineers must always be ethical? That was yeah. a very yeah. you know, nearly 100% agreed because it must be ethical. Yeah, that's nearly. But I'm interested in the few who said that it's not must. Do you... It was you, just only about 1%. Just 1%? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Then the second question, um, you, in the recommendation, I did not see anything or read anything about the role that the universities, universities plays in placing in the engineers the desire to be ethical. Yeah, the, the thing is, actually, I have another survey that I developed, which was going to go to students, actually. That's something that will be in the future. I will discuss with Professor Adams and then see how that can be. Uh, develop, but there is an overall plan and recommend a set of recommendations that I am going to be given that will encourage us to start maybe including ethics components in our curriculum, you know, back at the university, so that by the time students get out, they. Um, if yeah, are you there, Vincent? Hello, it has yeah, I'm here. It has been introduced. Um, it has been introduced as that. In the university, at least K University. Okay. But you see, what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking of is in engineering, when somebody does something and let's say gets something like forty percent and it's a pass, mm -hmm. what it simply means is that I don't need to get hundred percent. And this is when people don't become ethical. The reason why people become corrupt is because they think that if I don't even achieve hundred and I achieve sixty. I am better than the person who achieved forty percent. I don't know whether I'm making sense. Yeah, but like I said before, there's no such thing as somewhat ethical or less ethical. You either ethical or not. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. So, yeah. So when you come to the university, where let's say somebody's supposed to draw, make some drawing, and the measurement should give you, let's say, ten point four five, and the person gets ten point four, and it seems to be close to ten point four five, it's likely to pass that individual. These are some of the things that makes it difficult for people to become very ethical. So in engineering, the first sometimes we call something like near enough. The person thinks that it is near enough. And if it is quite close to what I want to get, then I can let it pass. Don't you think some of these things work against being very ethical? 
Well, Sam, um, can I help you here? I'm sorry to interject. Sure. Um, but Mimi, sorry, it's Vincent the name, sorry to call you Mimi again. Yeah, Vin yeah, Vincent, yeah. Uh, I mean, we are talking about ethics. I mean, I think it's substantially yeah, yeah. different from, you know, complying with standards and doing what is right as an engineer. Of course, when, of course, you don't get 100%. So the tendency is that sometimes your engineering judgment may be faulty because even when you're in school, you didn't get 100%. You know, that is a possibility. That's why we use our factor of safety to ensure that we do things right. That is substantially different from ethics because ethics has to do with, you know, not respecting exactly what you're supposed to do and respecting the code of ethics and allowing yourselves to be used to do the things that are wrong, you know, bordering on corruption and things like that. But um, engineering standards, I think those are slightly different. That one we have to look no, at professional development and all that. I still think that, I mean, when you talk about ethics, sometimes you have standards to go by them. And if yeah. you don't go by it, you are not being ethical. Yeah, that, that, that is by the standards, the ethics standards. If you fall short of it, you are not being ethical. But if you fall right, short of engineering standards because perhaps your judgment was faulty, that is a completely different thing that we should look at. That can also happen. Okay, let, let's... All right. Let's I'll, I'll, I'll rest my case. Let's get uh, Ebenezer here. Okay, thank you. Um, I think what the other uh, prof or the president elect, you know, said really answered my, 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 my issue. But when we are not careful with this online publication, and uh, you know a case which we think probably has been completed or probably at a certain stage completed and then we publish it what happens if it goes on appeal and the, and the case turns you know over how do you handle so i think the issue of publishing it must be carefully looked at otherwise we'll end up <laughs> uh, no, dealing with issues that are not even our domain Shifting focus on institution. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, but if if it goes to an appeal, I think once a decision is made, there is room for that individual to appeal to the ethics body. So the ethics, you know, body is just going to wait until all cases, everything has been resolved before it gets posted. So they're not gonna put something out there when they realize that there is the opportunity for uh, an appeal. So I think there's a disconnect there. Do you want to make sure that- well, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a legal person though, but I, I don't know at what stage can we say that a case is complete in court. A case can be completed in court, but if it is found out that there's any room for appeal, I think you can go for appeal. So at what stage do we put the barrier that this is complete or uh, complete? So therefore, we can go ahead and publish our, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, issues on, online. So I don't know if there's anyone who can assist on that. Uh, I'm just trying to try myself this time. Yeah, I think we, we're talking about two different things here. The cases that make it to the courts are different from the ones that the professional body is going to review and then uh, take final decisions on. I think at this point, we are on the side of where the engineering profession is the one dealing with the situation rather than you know the legal system. Extreme cases, that's when it gets uh, into the legal system. Okay, uh, <laughs> all right, okay, thank you. Let me allow others to come in. Okay, now uh, maybe uh, let's see here, Prince. Uh, let's see, Prince. Okay, Prince. Yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. Yes. Hello, Prof. Um, I'm calling, like I'm contributing from Nanjing in China. I've joined a program hey. there. And I'm okay. very happy. That's nice. I'm very happy we are using this platform in getting our educational teams going. Now, I wanted to um, speak on two things, um, whether it's possible to have discussions on 
some environmental factors and underlying effects that contribute or breeds to on ethical behavior in professional engineers in Ghana. Yeah. That is why. And uh, yeah, I, think, I think you are way ahead of us. I think this is the beginning for us. So we, we get and, taking baby steps, we'll get there. Maybe you want to okay. do and, Yeah. And the second aspect is, is it possible to be sharing test cases which appear on a regular basis in other ethic committees of either um, our institution or allied engineering professional bodies and in the court of laws as well, for us to have deliberations on them. That will also help us in educating us more and creating awareness to most of us in dealing with issues concerning ethics. Yeah, I, I think that one goes back to recommendation six, where I say stress the importance of the code of ethics to members. And so I think what you're talking about will be good. Okay, so here, for example, I don't know whether the institution puts out a newsletter uh, on a periodic basis. So in a situation like that, we can feature an ethics, you know, article, okay, in a newsletter that goes to uh, the uh, members. And we can take, you know, your suggestion and incorporate, you know, things like that in there. So in this case, it's like we're trying to get members to learn more about ethics. Or the other thing too is maybe we could just uh, put some scenario online and then just let members to, you know, take a crack at it to see how they feel about it. is this ethical or unethical. And then they could just send in, you know, some uh, comments about uh, scenarios like that. So I think what you're suggesting is good. And I think that's something that the institution will have to consider. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Sure, uh, let's see here. And then we have St. John. Hi, St. John. Oh, no, 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 oh, the men's, uh, let's see here. Yeah, hello, Prof. Yeah. Yeah, St. John here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Excellent presentation. Thank you. And I want to add my voice to um, those of us, ca uh, those calling for um, more of these, um, more of these, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, use, the use of this platform to actually disseminate knowledge and, uh, um, I mean, teaching us. A, a colleague wants to know uh, how some of these things would work in a military environment. And uh, by the way, the use of, um, Someone using Mimi when it's Vincent is it an ethical situation? Thank you. <laughs> Mimi hide his identity. Uh, no, it's not. It's not unethical. He could be using his wife's phone. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, yeah. I think I saw Squadron Leader and Penis hand up um, sometime. I don't know whether he's still available. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you're talking about, uh, uh, let's see here. Yeah, squadron leader, SAA Ampini. So we want to have a lot of impact with our military professionals. I have seen that. Yes. Uh, Prof. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, and the question okay. I have in mind is what uh, St. John also asked. That's um, while we are talking about the broader issues of engineering ethics, uh, how are we going to apply, let me take it off, uh, how are we going to apply uh, these concepts in, an, in a military environment? Because the military is usually close to, um, to civilians. And so if even there are some uh, engineering ethics issues, uh, you wouldn't know about them unless we report them to the uh, Ghana Institution of Engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is our first ethics class, <laughs> if you will. I think we're going to have a progression and then talk about applied ethics and then bring in case studies and all that and then bring in scenarios 
so that we will be able to look at certain situations. How does that apply in relation to maybe the code of ethics that we have established? So we will get there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, we, Paul. We, get, we just know <laughs> there yet. I think this is the beginning. This is the beginning, and it's good for us to have the conversation. I think that was the whole purpose. If we can come in, initiate uh, a conversation like this, so that that awareness that we want to create, you know, will be fruitful. Okay, going forward. So we, this is not going to be the first and the last. We're going to be continuing this sort of uh, ethical uh, presentation. Thank you, Prof. Sure. Let's see here, uh, Banahini Albert. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the platform as well. Um, it's about 5 a.m., uh, 6 a.m. now here in where I am in my jurisdiction, uh, practice in the province of Alberta. Okay. And uh, we, uh, we have a very similar uh, procedure as the uh, Prof was uh, alluding to. And I believe that will be serve us a great purpose if we allow uh, these ethical procedures uh, embedded in our system here in Ghana. I actually got my membership way back in the early 90s in Ghana and um, um, I didn't go through any ethics exams and I don't think there's still any ethics exams in Ghana to be able to practice line, uh, engineering in Ghana. Um, given that Someone has already mentioned uh, the University of uh, Sciences and Technology in Kumasi. It's uh, providing some ethical ethics course. We still will probably need, as an organization, um, uh, GHIE to establish a, a process whereby you need to pass an ethics exam before you are given uh, the ability to practice engineering in Ghana. So I think that is something we have to take into consideration. I this one I they have been a few. <laughs> yes, uh, if, if I can intervene on that. Um, right now, according to our competency requirements, uh, you're supposed to do 18 credits of CPD every year for your license to be renewed. Although I have to admit that we are not strictly implementing that because other than that, most of our members will not have their license renewed. But we are, we are getting there okay. to ensure that we can. And then out of those 18, you are supposed to do at least four uh, CPDs on ethics, on ethics education. And we normally deliver one or two ethics evening lectures, but that's one of, one of the people have said, we need to do this not only in Accra um, and the other major branches. And in fact, I'm having a discussion with uh, Sam, Professor Sam Abibio to go to Tamale I've seen uh, Professor Saini there, so I'm sure he's smiling, <laughs> you know, and then uh, <laughs> Takradi and other places so that we can have these, uh, sometimes the man-to-man -man discussions. But we would like to use this platform um, a lot more so that our colleagues in, in, in Canada, in China, and uh, you know, so we, they can all get in and share their different perspectives uh, to um, increase our skills and knowledge in this area. So we'll do that. And we are also collaborating with GIZ, the, G the German uh, Development Agency, to have an online uh, ethics sort of uh, a questionnaire as a module. So maybe you may encode an exam. We are still developing it. We, we started those discussions last year. Unfortunately, because of what we are, we are having right now, it has slowed down a bit. But we are hopeful that mm -hmm. um, by the last quarter of this year, that should be in place so that um, every member can go onto our website and be asked a certain number of questions and then we'll be able to assess the person and, and provide as we go forward. So that's what I can say from the, the Ghana Institution of Engineering the Secretariat uh, point of view. Thank you very much. I think it's a journey and uh, we should take it uh, uh, a step at a time and that's a good uh, direction. Thank you. Okay, the president is here and he would like to say something. Uh, as part of the pre-examination workshop, um, there is um, ethics, uh, some amount of time devoted to ethics and in the professional interviews that we have, uh, 
uh, ethics, it's parts of uh, the subjects that you have, you have talked about. So um, to a large extent, or to a little extent, um, it's been incorporated in a professional interview before people get licensed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, looks like you already exceeded an hour. We haven't even looked at module two yet, but you still have <laughs> questions. I need some. Uh, I need some advice, AED. <laughs> I, I think, uh, Prof, we can go on to module two very quickly. Yeah. We can very quickly, and then after that, we can complete with some questions and then plan again for a week or two later. Yeah, I don't want to miss their lunch. Yeah. So if you if you could share the module too, that would be fine. This is Professor Omsu. Oh no. What do you do here? Uh, module two. Hold on a second. I just want to. Let me get my technical person. So in the meantime, we can take some more questions. Um, um, it's better to use the raise your hand uh, feature in the group chat. It's there so that we can see who wants to speak. It's, if you go to the chat at the bottom of your screen, you go to the bottom of your screen and there's a chat there. If you get in there, you can have raise hand so that you can indicate that you want to be given the floor to speak. Right now we have Eugene Jampo, uh, and I think uh, Theo is still on. So uh, Sam, um, maybe you can take some questions as you fix the module too. Sure. Who is? Um... There is uh, there is Neil Kai on, uh, former vice president is on. So uh, whether he wants to speak again, yeah. So we yeah, can unmute him. Yeah. He's on now. I'm, I'm already unmuted. Okay. Um, just a, a quick one um, to, to say that um, this technology allows us to democratize education uh, across the institution. Uh, we've had complaints from people who are at various places in the country and that we hold lectures and we are unable to participate. Um, when you do, uh, let's say, a Facebook Live, um, the, the boundary requirements and um, its ability to allow for participation is a bit limited compared to uh, what we have with Zoom. So I think uh, this is a good, a good step to go uh, so that we can do all presentations, even post-COVID. Um, if there are presentations at the institution, we should put them on Zoom as well, so that people outside the, the place of the, the presentation can participate. They can ask questions and so on. We can even see them. So this is a good, a good step and I'd like us to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's move on to module two now. Uh, in this case, we look at uh, practitioners workplace ethical experiences and observation and we want to understand workplace ethical issues observed or experienced by engineering practitioners and then describe ways to improve workplace ethics okay we look at five main uh, focus areas talking about general work environment uh, work performance what are the ethical issues there and then work attendance and punctuality workplace you know, resources, and then personal action. Okay, so in this particular case, the data was stratified into public versus uh, private. And so we have 42% uh, for the public sector, and then the other 58% for the uh, private sector. Uh, the question was whether you, people are familiar with your agency's firm, agency or firm's code of ethics. In this case, we broke it into private versus public. 
Okay, so if I look at all the bars, I sum them up, that should be 100. That representing the entire data set. And then in this case, I will say that 50% uh, of the data set represent uh, private sector people who are familiar with the uh, workplace code of ethics. But if I were to look at the, let me just see here, I just need to mute that, okay. So if I were to look at just the private sector, then I can say that we have about 87% who are familiar with the workplace code of ethics compared to uh, the public sector, 94%. And then uh, the question was, do you know who to report to at your workplace in case you experience or observe ethical misconduct? Uh, apparently about 12% in red, okay, here in the nine plus three, they have no clue who to report to in case they observe or experience any ethical misconduct. And then uh, we're looking at whether you believe that your uh, employer communicates ethics as a priority at a workplace. In this case, we have about, let's see here, 24 and then 13. Together, that will be 37% from both the private and the public sector indicating that they strongly agree that their employers communicate ethics as a priority. Uh, and then we're talking about supervisors. Supervisors modeling strong ethical behavior. So in this case, those who strongly agree that their supervisors model strong ethical behavior, the private sector, about 24%, and then 20%. Uh, so we look at 44% of the entire data set indicating that supervisors model strong ethical behavior. We wanted to look at junior employees. So if the supervisors are modeling ethical behavior, what about junior employees? In this case, uh, we look at a data set, 14 and eight, 22% strongly agree that junior employees model strong ethical behavior. And then uh, here, I think I had it on auto mode. Uh, if you look at the screen, I put a previous two slides side by side. Let's look at supervisors uh, for the top and then junior employees for the bottom. And then I'm looking at a private sector, okay? supervisors, and then private sector, uh, junior employees. And all I'm doing is just comparing the dark green bars. Okay, so if I look at this vertically, I can see that supervisors, okay, and then junior employees in the private sector, their bars are larger than those in the public you know, sector. So all we saying that there's a strong agreement that private sector supervisors and junior employees appear to model strong ethical behavior compared to the uh, counterparts in the public sector. And then uh, we wanted to look at level of ethical misconduct at the workplace. Okay, if we look at the results, the focus is on moderate to very high, whether workplace ethical misconduct is moderate, high or very high. So if we look at the sum there, yellow, pink, and red, that's what we're interested in, moderate to very high. In this case, we realize that for the private sector, about 37.5% uh, indicate that um, ethical misconduct, moderate to very high compared to about 74% in the public sector. So obviously there's something going on in the public sector. And then uh, the question was asked whether people are comfortable reporting perpetrators of ethical misconduct. Uh, if we look at the red bars, okay, 17 here, 16 there, we saying that about 34% of respondents, they don't feel comfortable reporting perpetrators of ethical misconduct. Why? They cite three main reasons. They are afraid of being exposed as a whistleblower or they are afraid of being harassed or no disciplinary action is usually taken when said cases are reported. So those were the main 
uh, reasons cited by people who were not reporting uh, perpetrators of ethical misconduct. And I can understand it if I am going to be exposed as a whistleblower. Why do I want to get into that state? Because I can uh, experience a hostile work environment. My life could be threatened in this case. So people don't want to do that. And then when they report cases, they expect some action to be taken. But if nothing is done, nobody wants to get involved. So those would be the three main reasons. Fear of being exposed as a whistleblower, action not taking, and then being afraid of being uh, harassed. Uh, the next one, uh, the question was asked whether employer has done enough to alleviate ethical misconduct. Uh, we're looking at it only about, let's see here, roughly about 20% strongly agree. I mean, in both, if we add both together, 15.5, 4.9, uh, roughly about 20% indicate that they strongly agree that uh, employees have done enough to alleviate ethical misconduct. Uh, let's talk about resource use at the workplace. And this one, the question was, in the past 12 months, I mean, prior to completing the survey, what did they observe in terms of workplace resource use? Uh, we noticed that accessing personal social media platforms during work hours, that appears to be the dominant uh, problem for both the private and the uh, public sector. And then we also noticed that besides abuse or misuse of uh, agency vehicles or equipment, the private sector are negatively outperform uh, the public sector in all the other areas. Uh, and then there are three actually uh, elements that I wanted to take a look at uh, that involve time, accessing personal social media platforms during work hours, frequent engagement in personal phone calls, uh, during work hours, and then spending time on computer doing non-agency work. These are all time-related. And so in a way, we're robbing companies of time. And the thing is, if we can quantify these in monetary terms, we can you know, provide some uh, valuable information to our employers and how to address uh, the issue. Because it's their time that have been uh, quote unquote, you know, stalling to do other stuff. And then in this case, we wanted to look at uh, the same issue, whether it's across certain age group or it's just being done by everybody. And in this case, if you look at uh, the data, uh, besides the 51, 55, 41 to 45, and then the 56 to 60 uh, year group, we realized that for the private sector, uh, resource misuse was basically across all age groups besides the three that have been noted. Uh, and then if we want to look at it by years of professional experience, is it uh, particularly associated with certain people with a uh, certain level of professional experience? Uh, in this case, we noticed that uh, the bulk of it was between five and 15 uh, years, as well as those with at least 20 years of experience, they were the ones who observed or experienced uh, resource misuse with respect to uh, company resources. Okay, and then I'm running through this quick. Uh, we look at the same situation for the public sector, and we notice that uh, the 31 to 35, 36 to 40, Okay, we're looking at the light blue and then uh, the near pink. Those are the ones who actually did observe resource misuse. Uh, same situation for the public sector. We're looking at my professional experience between five and 15 uh, years, as well as those uh, with at least 20 year experience. They witness more uh, company resource misuse. Uh, in terms of work attendance and punctuality, Ms. Kanda, let's see here. Uh, reporting late to work and then leaving work early without permission 
failure to observe time limits set for lunch and breaks. Those are the top, you know, three for both the public and the private sector. People are reporting late to work, but they want to leave early without permission. And then when it's time for lunch, they don't observe, you know, time limits set. So, so those are big problems. And we wanted to go through the same situation, uh, whether this goes with a particular age group or, or in a, both the public and the private sector. I think you did have the opportunity to uh, listen to the PowerPoints before. So I'm just going to rush through this quickly here. Uh, the same thing here. And then let's look at work performance, ethical misconduct. Uh, in terms of work performance misconduct, if we look at the public sector, inflating costs in budget and procurement processes, that's the number one problem for the public sector. If we're looking at the private sector, then soliciting or accepting unauthorized compensation uh, or rewards uh, or gifts for work-related uh, situations, that is the problem for the private sector. So here I just look at the top four, falsifying records, disclosing confidential information, and then inflating costs. Those are the major uh, work performance misconducts. And we went through the same situation, whether it's across certain age group or professional group. Okay, we just moving fast here. And then personal action, ethical misconduct. In this case, we're looking at uh, nepotism, telling lies to coworkers, Intimidation by senior staff, retaliation for speaking up against unethical practices, and then appointment of unqualified people to specific job positions, and then making false or malicious statements about co-workers. Those are the main personal action ethical misconducts witnessed uh, in the past 12 months. Okay, and then the same situation here, we want to check whether it goes across certain uh, age groups or setting uh, professional experience uh, groups. Okay, so with that, I think I'm just going to go ahead and then do the uh, summary of the findings. Okay, so if we take them one by one, for the overall work environment, we're saying that only about 10.5% are not familiar with their workplace in a code of ethics. Okay, 12% do not know who to report to on ethical issues at a workplace. 24% uh, in the private sector strongly agree that their employers uh, communicate ethics as a priority compared to 13% in the public sector. Uh, there's a strong agreement among respondents that private sector supervisors and junior workers model strong ethical behavior better than their counterparts in the public sector. 22% uh, respondents indicate that ethical misconduct at their workplace is moderate to very high compared to 31 in the public sector. 34% uh, do not feel comfortable reporting perpetrators of ethical misconduct and decide three main reasons. Just being exposed as a whistleblower, fear of being harassed, and then uh, the fact that no action uh, is taken when they report in such cases. And then we're looking at those who strongly agree that employers have done enough to alleviate workplace ethical misconduct, that's roughly about 20%. Okay, company resource use. I think the three main challenges there, we're looking at personal social media platforms during work hours, that is the big problem for both the public and the private sector. And then, even though they're both doing it, the private sector employees tend to spend more time on the computer doing non-company work, accessing social uh, media platforms and frequently engaging in personal phone calls, okay, compared to the uh, counterparts in the public sector. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the rest, it's about the age groups and then experience, okay? So we just bypass that. Uh, let's see here. Reporting late to work. I think that's the dominant misconduct associated with both the private and public sector. Okay, and then those leaving work early, 
without permission, and then failing to observe time limits set for lunch and other breaks, and then failing to notify supervisors of impending absence or lateness to work and engaging in unexcused or extensive absenteeism. These uh, misconducts are more common in the public sector, even though we do have that also occurring in the private sector. Okay, then misconducts in the private and public sectors witnessed by practitioners with varying years of uh, professional experience, but more notably with those with at least 20 years of experience. Okay, and then we also looked at the work performance related misconducts. Uh, for the public sector, I think inflating costs in budget and procurement, that is the big one there. And then for the private sector, I think it's soliciting or accepting unauthorized compensation or rewards from outside sources for matters relating to work. But in both cases, all four uh, work performance misconducts uh, occur. And then uh, in terms of personal action misconducts in both public and private sectors, uh, we have the top six, uh, nepotism, intimidation by senior staff, appointment of unqualified uh, people to specific positions, uh, telling lies to co-workers, and then retaliation for speaking up against unethical uh, practices. Those are the major findings there when it comes to personal action misconduct. Okay, now we just go straight to the recommendations. <clears throat> what can be done to improve workplace ethical misconduct? Yeah, I ran through this quickly because if you did download the uh, slides before, you had the opportunity. I think here, I'm just looking at two main things here. Communicating ethics as a priority, I think that's the uh, big one. And then uh, what role companies can play, talking about leaders, can play in uh, communicating ethics as a priority. Let's look at the first one. We're talking about communicating ethics as a priority. We want to look at, I think I might have, uh, okay. If we want to do that, then for whatever document we're going to develop to guide our members or our workers, we need to have representation from all levels of the organization. Okay, so initial buying is critical. Everybody must be involved. Most of the time, we're talking to only upper uh, management. And then once we talk to upper management, we get some few ideas, then we just prepare a document and then dump it on everybody. But if we can have participation from all levels of the company or uh, office, then at least people are involved. Once a document is produced and they know, okay, I was part of it, so I must, you know, follow what I put out there. Okay, so once you can get the initial buying from all the uh, various branches, you get a facilitator, and then they will help in the development, you know, process. Uh, what about leaders? Okay, we want people to model ethical behavior. Can we show them by example? I think that's what this is about. If it's about my word, I tell you one thing, I don't want to go and do something else. Okay, then I lose that respect, you know, from you. So here, can we model strong ethical behavior as leaders? And then one of the things that we noticed from the survey was when people report on ethical uh, behavior, nothing is done. But if we can take a swift and fair uh, response to any unethical behavior, then it sends a message to uh, all the other uh, members that, hey, management is not going to tolerate this sort of you know, behavior. And it's been shown in research that 
if leaders model strong ethical behavior and they can react swiftly you know, to cases that are reported, it moves people to do the right thing most of the time. Okay, and then the other thing too is that is it possible that we can develop a process and criteria to include ethics in the periodic reviews of e performance? Can we notice that people are coming to work late in respecting you know, time limits set for breaks and lunch? Uh, there are so many issues. So here, if for example, I know that my annual review is going to include things like uh, how punctual I'm, I, I, I am at, uh, to work or how uh, much respect I give to times allocated for break and lunch periods, then of course, I just want to make sure that I don't go against those. So if we can come up with some sort of uh, process or criteria to include things like that, it might uh, help. Okay, and then integrating ethics into workplace uh, culture through ongoing training. I think that's something that we already talked about, that training, training is uh, essential. We want to make sure that we expose our workers to a lot of ethics. In the uh, Let's see here. And then can we create an environment? Can you mute your mic if you <laughs> Okay. Can you mute your mic? I suggest the host you mute. Uh, let's see here. Okay, and then one of the things that we observed was people didn't feel comfortable uh, reporting cases of ethical misconduct. Why? Because they are afraid of being exposed as whistleblowers. And like I said before, if you are exposed as a whistleblower, you do have challenges. Being exposed to a hostile work environment, that is a big issue there. Uh, sometimes if it's against your supervisor uh, or somebody above you, chances are they might retaliate and you don't want to see that. And then the other thing too is, is it possible to provide some sort of uh, incentives? If people rise to the occasion when it comes to ethical issues, at least let's recognize them, you know, so that people will notice that, oh, this is a good thing and I can emulate that sort of uh, situation. Uh, and then can we create an ethics uh, helpline or office? Designate someone as the ethics compliance officer. Uh, the thing is, if I know there is an office out there or somebody that I have to talk to when I experience uh, some ethical issue, then I feel more confident to start looking at reporting cases, you know, for example. Okay, so those are some of the things that we can do. Thank you, and I think at this time, we will go into our uh, question and, let me see here, oops. I'm using this system for the first time, and so, uh, let me get, uh, let's see here. Let me get this technical guy here to, Okay. 
yeah, I'm trying to get my technical guy here to. What do you want to do so we can assist? Let's see here. So you, yeah. you, can go, you can go to the bottom of your screen and click the share screen and it will go off and come back to the participants. And then anybody who wants to ask a question can use the uh, raise hand feature and then, and then you can let them in. Me too. Uh, I think I have to stop sharing now. Oh, I, I just need to go back to it. That was two A. Just go back to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Um, I think um, we've spent quite a bit of time, so we'll allow for some few questions, so that we can just round up this session, um, not to keep people too much away from yeah. the lunch period. Yeah, so if you want to ask a question, uh, you can use the raise hand feature, um, which is on the chat at the bottom of your screen. If you go into the chat and you click raise hand, then uh, it will show on those who want to speak, and then uh, you can have the floor there. Yeah, we have, okay, we have Ni Okai Theo. Yeah, Theo again, yeah. Yes, just, just a, a quick one. Yeah. Um, the three students. One of them that was surprising to me mm -hmm. uh, was that when it came to the misuse of company resources, yeah, uh, in terms of the use of um, um, social media and stuff like that, yeah, the, the private sector was the most guilty, and I find that quite surprising. Yeah, that would be something that we can look into. There's something that, you know, can be looked into. Why that is the case, I have no idea, to be honest with you. I mean, these sort of uh, results, you know, probe, uh, I mean, it's like, it's probing into things now. Look at it, time situation there. We're reporting to work late. We're using work time to access, you know, uh, media platforms, spending time on uh, the phone. That's something, it's a big study by itself. So I think this is a good start. It's bringing out things that can be, you know, studied more. Okay, Ebeneza, let's see here. Ebenezer? Yeah, I, I, again, um, when you said mm -hmm. you don't know how come, um, I'm not too you know, comfortable with that because um, the private happened? sector mm -hmm. you know, engagements are more demanding in terms of working and keeping companies um, properties, you know, well under good you know, control. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm still struggling to believe how that survey could be right. Um, I don't know how I do, you, 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 so if you can give us, which you one? know, Let some me... more, you know, details, because uh, which... the details that, you know, private sector seems to be misusing companies, you know, uh, properties that uh, let's see here. Which slide was? Let me just go back to. Is this for the public? Uh, let's see here. 
Oh, Sam, I think you were just reporting on the data set you captured. Yeah, that's yeah. what I, I was doing. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but it's difficult it, for him to explain that. Yeah, yes. I, I think that's the point. So here, if this is the information that I'm reporting, then it's something that you can go back and then look into why that is the case. That would be something, that's why I said this is an opportunity for us to dig into these uh, results. Okay, so I, I think at this point, I won't be able to explain what goes on within, you know, the private sector. To be honest with you, I don't work in the system and I have no clue what is happening here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see here. We have Richard. Uh, let's see. Hello, Prof. Yeah, hi, Richard. Thanks so much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I want to ask um, this question. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little bit confused here um, mm -hmm. with regard to some of these uh, ethical misconducts. Mm -hmm. um, what is the limit of the GHI when it comes to reporting these ethical misconducts? Because from the presentation, we saw that some people do not even know uh, whether their company has a code of uh, conduct. Mm -hmm. So if there is an ethical violation, who do you report to? Do you report to the GHIE? Because some of them are quite serious, like stealing company uh, uh, property. It's, it, it borders on criminal uh, this thing. So do you report to the police? No. So the, what is the, the thing is, the GHIE when I, it comes to... I think what, what this survey is asking is, for every workplace, normally you have something called employee handbook. And within that handbook, they have their own code of ethics. Okay. And so this is a situation where you're looking at maybe a company and not the GHIE in this case. So here, this is what is happening in their own, you know, uh, workplaces. So at their own workplace, do they have something like that, a code of ethics? So in that case, if there's anything occurring within the company, they have somebody that they can report to. I think that's what this is all about. Okay, just, just to add on to what uh, Prof. Has said, mm -hmm. at the GHI, we have the Professional Practice and Ethics Committee, which is a standing committee of the GHI Council that deals with uh, public complaints. And I think... Um, we've had instances in the past when uh, some of our members, uh, I don't want to mention names as some people said, but it had to do with some engineers at uh, Electricity Corporation and the Ministry of Energy saw reason to write to the institution for us to investigate their conduct and then sanction them. And I think as part of our own rules of engagement, our code of ethics and the, the oath that we swear on being inducted as members of the institution, that we have a fiduciary duty um, to report this kind of conduct either to our own professional body or at least through your governance system where you work. And if you feel that your governance system is not dealing with the issue to your expectations, you can always fall on your professional institution. We are here to give you a backup. We are here as the welfare you know, we have a welfare committee. It's part of the engineer's welfare as well. If you are being pushed to do things that are ethical in your workplaces and because of uh, fear of being uh, victimized or promotion-wise and other things, you can quietly come to the institution and report that matter to us and we'll take it up. And it's a big institution. We have close to, what, 11,000 members and our voice will carry some pressure to bear on whoever is... Uh, inflicting that kind of pain on our members. So we have both the Professional Practice and Ethics Committee and we have a Welfare Committee. So it may straddle the two committees and you can't always, you're welcome to come to the Secretariat and make those complaints. So it will depend on you, the members, to be frank, honest, and be abiding by the oath that you swear as engineers. The engineer's pledge is not something that you read only on your induction day. It's something that should guide you through your professional career. And I would advise all of you to continue to go back to the pledge and read it. If you don't have, you don't have copies, you can email the secretariat. We can send you copies for you to read again. And perhaps maybe we should even put it on the website. Yeah, but I think what uh, the ED is 
indicating, you have to start at your own workplace. Your own workplace, they might have uh, somebody to report to on ethical issues. If that doesn't work, you try it one, two, it doesn't work, then that's when you step outside and then look at what will be the next agency that I can uh, take my case to. And so here, if this is uh, engineering related or that violation is against a member, then you can come to the institution and then uh, file that complaint. But you have to start exactly. your workplace. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I'm, 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 I'm okay with that. I don't see any, any more hands. No. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Yeah. Please, my name is Zipporah. I'm a guest here. I'm a student. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Don't that's worry. Fine. Please, I wanted to ask a question. No, it's just I just linked it this way. I was thinking that since students are going to graduate and be professionals, why don't we start sometime the training from the tertiary? Then when they complete, they know that this is what happens in the professional world because even sometimes when programs are being organized in the tertiary institution and it's not really entertaining, and students don't really find it, find it the need to maybe read something just as you said, how people are saying that you don't even know that something like that is even available because they don't find it very interesting. So I, I think that there should be a need where students are supposed to know that if they go outside um, school, this is what happens and they have to take note of that. And secondly, about the office where you said there should be someone you report to, I think that if they should make it more private, more like a media or platform, where people report such cases because it would be very funny if there is an office and someone is entering. Everybody thinks that maybe the person entering is going to say something to whoever is in charge. And as a result, they're going to call the person a whistleblower, even if the person went there for another particular reason. Yeah, that is what I was thinking. Yeah. Sam, do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about me walking into a building and then somebody thinking that I'm going I, to... I think, I think what she meant was that if there's a designated office in an agency and say this is the ethics office, yeah, or this is the ethics compliance officer, mm -hmm. anybody seen walking into that office is seen as a, a whistleblower is going to pass on someone. You know, I think she has a point there, you know. Uh, because the only thing that may take you into that office is to go and report uh, some misdemeanor of a sort. So it's something perhaps we can all think about. Yeah, we, we, we do have them. So maybe that, maybe I was thinking, you know, differently. We do have them. Students can go. We have, you know, places where if I have ethical issue, I can just, there's a helpline too. So you don't necessarily have to go there. You can take the phone and then call that uh, a place and then uh, put your complaint there Talk to somebody and then they will tell you uh, set an appointment with you so you can call that's one way to do it but I get it oh, okay. okay I'm not saying that as a student we're going to report some that's not what I'm saying I'm saying that just as you said for example if there is a book given to uh, maybe if you're in a professional I don't know how things are like being given a book, people don't really see it necessary to even open the book and read it because after I know how to go about things in the office, so they don't really see the need for me to even go through the ethics of the company. So I was thinking, since um, some we say that charity begins at home, so from our tertiary institution, we could even have a seminar or something to let students know the need of these little things that we sometimes ignore. That is what I'm saying with the first um, suggestion. Okay. I Zipporah. Zipporah. So it's not necessarily we going there. Hmm. Yes, sir. I want to support what you've said. I mean, I think somebody indicated that KNUST have integrated oh, okay. ethics into their curriculum now. Um, I, I haven't seen and gone through the details. So I don't know what type of uh, uh, Dr. Adams or Professor Adams perhaps has left. So 
he would have been in a better position. But I think that what the institution is doing now is to engage all the tertiary education um, institutions. Um, one, they should have student chapters. And we want, we've written to them since last year, all the engineering education tertiary institutions where they provide engineering courses um, so that they can revive their student chapters. Because we want to imbibe these uh, uh, protocols or principles or ethics, whatever you call them, into the students even before they graduate. So that the transition into professional life is very seamless. It doesn't become difficult. And, and because engineering is the only profession where you have a lot of members who have finished and continue to practice and are not even professional engineers. They have not been chartered as professional engineers with their own staff to do their work. And some have practiced for 20 years, 25 years, although we have an engineering council law, a law that debats that kind of practice. You know, uh, all the lawyers, as soon as they finish on the day of their uh, being sworn in as lawyers, they sign in to the Ghana Bar Association to become members right there and then. The doctors do the same thing. You know, they become members of the Ghana Medical Association and then they are given their they are they're licensing by the Medical and Dental Council. Engineering, somehow, uh, people finish, they rise up sometimes even in the ministries to become directors, and they are not members of the professional body. And it is illegal. So these are things that um, the institution has to work harder to interface with all the major engineering organizations. Um, and also, especially with the training institutions at the tertiary level, so that they can really put together this ethics training as part of the modules for the students even before they complete so that it becomes a part of them. They know what is expected of them when they get into the practice. That's what I want to add, Sam. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's the whole idea. If we can start, you know, from uh, the tertiary institutions, like you said, I mean, we do the same thing. And that's why I said I teach a course, you know, to college seniors. So before they come out, they know what to expect, you know, coming out of the system and then joining the professional body. Okay, let's see here. We have Helen. Yeah, Helen. Yes. Um, yes, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good afternoon. I think I heard, I heard you ask about um, what we do at KNUS regarding ethics. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to give a brief idea of some of the things that are touched on okay. and so for example we look at moral framework we look at uh, moral reasoning and codes of ethics in general um, you know what is the use of the code of ethics what are the benefits and so on and so forth and we look at safety issues and um, also look at workplace responsibilities and rights honesty and integrity and then also look at the code of ethics and disciplinary procedures of the Ghana Institution of Engineering um, and then in addition of that in addition to that we also look at codes of ethics of other institutions outside Ghana um, so in a nutshell that is what is done I see Engineer Japon, do you have anything to say on that? Well, I think uh, maybe we have to mainstream that a bit more, um, share some of the best practices elsewhere. Let's look at what you do in America, for instance, Let's look at the contents of the, the ethics course, and perhaps you interface with the likes of uh, Professor Adams and the other institutions around, see whether we can have some alignment so that we, we give them some more detailed training on that before they graduate. Um, of course, in our time, there was nothing like that. Who had never taught any ethics <laughs> in school when we were doing our bachelor's course? So uh, that was a complete different generation. Now, uh, all over the world, they are doing more of ethics and even entrepreneurship and communications because they know the work of engineers it's, it's, it's public oriented. We do things that serve the public and we need to communicate our programs and our projects. So communication for the engineering professional is very important. And uh, 
who were thought to be very stiff and dull and you know not sociable is, is one aspect that the institution wants to work on to improve the soft skill set of the engineers and uh, uh, again we are trying to as i said uh, migrate a lot of the seminars onto these kind of platforms um, so that we can improve the skill set and the soft skill set of the professional engineers so do we have some more questions because uh, time we are now doing just about two hours we want to bring it to a close so we'll give an opportunity for one or two more questions if there if there's not yeah i raised my hand and i wasn't called oh i'm sorry joe 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 uh, i'm sorry joe mr uh, sam um, let's allow joe to ask uh, a question well i mean uh, i raised my hand quite a while ago and uh you know a lot of stuff has been said uh, but, but my point is that i just want to commend you Kovna and prof for what you're doing here it is so so critical to our development uh without technology we cannot develop and Someone once said that uh, the conscience of technology is engineering. And therefore, the engineers that we have, if they can live up straight with discipline and ethics, that is when we can start changing the narrative and our development will take hold. A couple of suggestions that I want to put forward. Uh, some of us could volunteer to go to some of these universities to talk about ethics and what, what the implications of it and help develop our young ones so that they can come back into the industry uh, with some ethical foundational stuff to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece is you had mentioned that uh, you're doing some collaboration with German institutions to try to develop some modules and all of that. I think uh, the way you want to take that is that maybe it become part of our certification whereby every year we can go online and take a module to really certify and make sure that we are living up to our ethical standards and behavior so that it will be the forefront of our conscience and what we do and that would definitely help with our development as well so again i commend you for putting this together prof uh, this is wonderful uh it is something that is so 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 missing in our environment here and i think this will help go a long way so thank you thank you too thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Prof. I want to thank uh, Drew Mensah. He is the CEO of Cosmos Energy, one of the major sponsors of, or corporate partners of the GHI. And we are very grateful for, for the comments he's made. It's, it's been of help to the institution for the last few years. Okay, Prof. Okay, do you want to wrap up? Oh, any more hands up? I can see yeah. friends here. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, I'm back on my second point that I, I highlighted on that you said I had um, kind of jumbled down a little bit. I, I'm very glad we are talking about the morality associated with our profession. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm also trying to sway the conversation to other aspects that we have to look out for. Um, when I was in Ghana before leaving for my postgraduate studies, I remember we had a series of um, lectures concerning the legislative instrument for the Engineering Council Act. And then um, I also saw that we had, as an institution, we had a powerful role to play in terms of um, restructuring courses and giving accreditation for engineering courses for all our tertiary universities in, in the country before leaving. And I think there's an opportunity like we have as an institution to look out to introduce ethic courses into our tertiary institution. We have, we have the mandate to do that. I don't know how far the LI had gone. Because while I'm studying, we have what we call a comprehensive record book for all graduates and postgraduates. And then it's like um, you attend a four-hour lecture, a four-hour lecture during the semester. You, you could go about four times in a year and you are required to go a minimum of six before you be giving your final certification, which is, which is part of the academic structure of um, the, the institution that I'm in now. That is the, the first aspect. The second aspect is also, I wanted to touch on the environmental factors I earlier raised on. I was speaking about um, enforcement of regulations and laws. And I see this has always been a problem for us as people in, in Ghana. We have all the powers, we have all the laws, and this brings my mind to remuneration of professionals, whether we have standardized them 
whether we have means to enforce them. So I think this, this, this should be an area that we should also have discussions on. And once we have this thing sorted out, the ethics that we've all been yearning to have in our society will somehow be streamlined back. And this is my little con uh, the contribution to the program. Thank you. So Hello, Toby. <laughs> Hello. Come on, this actually right? Um, um, Sam, uh, uh, please offer the floor to past president Atu Wright. I'm sorry, I'll get to the others. The past yes, president. get going to be uh, one minute. Um, yeah. I have been listening to it, and I think that, um, good as it may be, I think that this uh, thing has been very subjective. We don't know the perspectives with, with which the people made, the, uh, uh, made those assessments and, uh, uh, and the surveys. Uh, I believe, and I think that if we want to talk going deeply, it might take too much time, but I'll just say that I think that this ethics education must go through the whole of, if we call uh, education education, then it must go through the whole education right from the start, because what we are calling education is not just um, uh, knowledge acquisition, or teaching and learning, but it must have two components. That is the uh, content, which is the uh, the teaching and the learning, and then the another component or vector, uh, which um, I, I call the direction or relevance, or that shapes how you're going to use that education because the content is a raw material that you have in, uh, in your hand. If you don't have uh, ethics, if you don't have a direction, uh, let me give you a simple uh, example. You can teach two people how to make security safe. One will use it to build a very good security system for a bank. The other one will use the same knowledge to break into that security system. Okay, so uh, that is the different uh, value systems that they have. And so if we are going to talk about ethics in engineering, it must be done within the global concept of a country or whatever. And it, it must encompass a whole lot of things, including culture, the uh, 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 security, um, what do you call it? The, all, all, all kinds of things that are not just the raw um, engineering content, but other things that together then will form education because education is not merely acquiring knowledge, but it's shaping the perception of the individual. It is the total education that will determine the direction you want to go. You may know how to build a road, but if you don't have a direction uh, uh, to wherever you want to, the destination, then the road will lead you to nowhere. And, and ethics plays a very important part in that component. Uh, so I, I think that I would like to discuss this further with you in there. And uh, we thank the uh, professor by starting this whole scheme and uh, uh, highlighting awareness and making us all enthusiastic about contributing to this uh, discussion. Thank you. I think that is the whole point. We wanted to generate you know, interest so we can start a conversation and then together we will be able to lay out where we want to go, you know, with this. And then such that our society will be ethical. That's where we, we want to be. So here is a process and I'm glad that the conversation has started and we have people like you coming in and then providing input. We do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, just, just to add on to Sam, I think it is a sad commentary on us uh, as engineers, and we have to be honest to say that uh, under 5% of our membership even responded to these questionnaires. We have to be a lot more engaging with our profession and the, our professional body as well. Um, of course, uh, and so maybe you may take the study or the reports of the, the, the results coming out of the survey with a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say a pinch of salt, but because it's a small sample. Perhaps if we had maybe 2,000, 3,000 members responding to the survey, we would have gotten a much truer picture of what is happening around, around this subject and, and around the country as well. So um, I think all of us here today, and today, fortunately, we've had about 127. That was the maximum I think we hit. It keeps going up and down, which is still well below what I think we can get because we had provided for at least 500 participants for this one. 
And so we, we want to be advocates to our other members and we send the communication and correspondence to every one of us, every one of us. So we want to expect our people, our members to be more engaged with their own institution. And I'm sure we'll get it gradually, as uh, Professor Furry said, uh, uh, Professor Abibu said, these are baby steps. So it's, it's a good first small step and we, we think we can do better. Sam, let's take the last three um, from Frank Dunu, Mazuta, and Albert Banahini and bring this to a close because we didn't want to go beyond two hours. We, we have to take the time in there. Okay, so, Frank, uh, if you can let Frank speak up, ask this question. Prof, thank you for the very informative uh, lecture. Your survey addressed issues on the uh, disclosure of information. But the reality is that in most of the institutions, both private and public, they don't actually allow employees to sign a non-disclosure agreement when they are employed. Again, mm -hmm. they don't also classify their information mm -hmm. and make it clear as to what is material information is material non-public information and what is material public information okay this leaves most employees confused okay. and then also not drawn yeah that's a good point mm -hmm. no when he's actually approaching a situation please Yeah, the connection. Yes, I'm. Hopefully, yeah, Mark, Mark, are you done, uh, Frank? Yes, I'm done. Yeah, I, okay. I don't know whether uh, Sam you like to respond or we go on to Mark. I, I didn't even catch it. The internet was going off here. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, Frank. Uh, Frank, can you repeat? Yourself. Yes. What I'm saying is that when employees are employed, one most of them do not sign non-disclosure agreements okay. with the organizations that employ them. Mm -hmm. Two, the organizations do not classify their information as to what is material information, what is material information, and what is material public information. Okay. Sam, is that, was that clear to you? Hello? I think it's uh, Sam. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I think some is some is struggling a bit with his. Uh, Um, can we take the question from Mark and then we'll see we'll, some uh, Frank will respond to you, okay? Mark, Mark Zuta, if you can um, unmute yourself. Sam, you are back on. Hello? Sam, are you back on? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Could you respond to what Frank said? I, I couldn't even catch the question. Because oh, you didn't get it? No. So maybe he can send me an email, we can talk about it. <coughs> yeah, the system. Okay, Frank, you can either use the, the chat. There's a chat, there's a chat option. And then uh, maybe he can respond to you. Um, there's a chat option, I can read a few, but um, there's a chat option, Frank. So I'm sorry, uh, I didn't hear you again. So 
Um, let's try the last question. I think it should be from, there's Albert Banahini. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, I really appreciate uh, being part of this uh, uh, Skype meeting. Uh, just a comment perhaps on more on the last speaker at all, uh, the former president. I think, uh, and basically almost all to all of us, we should embrace uh, this uh, process of getting ethics into our system here because definitely it, we as engineers are, are responsible to uh, uh, basically uh, creating a lot of structures in place and making sure that no one goes uh, home and head. So the issue that I want to talk about here is that uh, we should find a way to really find a, enforce our ethics, whatever ethics um, principles that we put in place. And that definitely may begin from our own body, the GHIE, and uh, making sure that we do not resist uh, the, the, that, this process. Uh, in other jurisdictions, obviously, um, the, 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 the engineering body within that particular jurisdiction it's is the one which which regulates engineering i asked a question earlier on the chat group which engineering profession and um, which body regulates engineering in ghana and i didn't get an answer to that whether it's the engineering council or is it the ghie and uh, we we got to work on that and find a way to make sure that the, the, the whichever regulates the body they have some sort of enforcement uh, uh, um, to, to, to that. So basically, I think it's a good journey that we are on and we need to publish most of the things we spoke about on the or on our website, whether it's the process of uh, really uh, bringing someone to to book in terms of uh, ethical practices or even in terms of basically getting uh, the ethics clear, the process and everything else. So yeah, we need to have things published on our website. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Albert. Um, just to try to uh, add, uh, answer a bit of your question. I mean, we have an engineering council now in place. It's taken us a bit of time to get that. Um, the law was passed in 2011. The Article 19 was passed in 2011. That regulates engineering practice in the country. The Ghana Institution of Engineering is a premier professional body that certifies engineers to practice. Uh, it's when you have been certified by us that we can dispatch your name to be registered with the Engineering Council of Ghana, which is a, a government body. Uh, ours is a non-profit, not-for-profit, non-governmental organization. It's a professional body that is registered under the professional body's decree of this country. So um, again, we are working on the regulations. Um, it took us a bit of time with support from BUSAC. We've conducted quite a number of stakeholder uh, meetings in Tamale, in Kumasi, in Takrade, and twice in Accra. And, uh, and so we've prepared the LI, uh, or the regulation, not an LI yet, gone through the ministry responsible, which is Wexenhausen, which oversees all the built environment. And then through the Wexenhausen ministry, presented to the Attorney General's office for them to have a look at it. And it's now in Parliament. It's now in Parliament waiting um, parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny. So we do hope that it can become um, a, an ally um, pretty soon, in which case then the teeth that it needs to be able to ensure that the right things are done will be, will be available to all of us. But in the meantime, the institution, um, as I said, had a professional practice and ethics committee. And so anybody who is a professional engineer, who is a member of this institution, is duty bound to respect our ethics and work according to the rules as we know it and according to the engineer's pledge as well. Um, may we take the last one from Nana Sapong. Nana Sapong. Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you. Yes. Unfortunately, I missed the first part because when I was trying to join, I was told that class was full. So I'm not sure if the question I'm about to ask has already been answered. But um, as we rightly mentioned, engineers or civil engineers play a very critical role in the development of infrastructure in Ghana. What I want to find out, I'm particularly um, base my question on roads. In most of the time when we do const when we construct roads, it's believed that we have engineers doing the supervision, even if we have a contractor on who has been um, contracted to design the road. 
roads have um, a lifespan and they have a certain they have a uh, time frame that you have to do maintenance and stuff but unfortunately what we find in our society is that after a few I don't know maybe a year or six months we see that the roads are not in the best shape that they're supposed to be causing potential harm to the road user what I want to find out is is Ghana have engineer in a position to find out when some of these things are glaring in your face that okay this road was constructed and definitely was an engineer on board but it's not um, servicing the way it's supposed to be can they take these things up I mean without any report and do a probe and find out which engineer was even on board for them to serve as a deterrent to other people where they are punished for people to know that if you don't do the right Thing. because most of the time what happens is that the society tends to blame the engineers not even the the um the contractors but they blame the supervising body making sure that the road is constructed right. sometimes we have influences from politicians yes but then i'm not sure if the institution can do something about it to ensure that we are enforcing the um rules and then making sure that engineers are acting ethically that's it. Thank you, Nana. I, I think as an institution, we have a role to play in that, but that the major responsibility falls on central government. They are the, the custodians of the public purse, and we are talking about investing the public purse, and it's not being used for value for money for the, the citizens. Um, of course, um, it depends on what contract you are talking about, but when things are so glaring, and as you said, uh, the institution and engineering profession has taken a bash from the public. I mean, so we feel it and we, we get a lot of these things. Yes, uh, we, have, we, we, have, we can play a role. There's a role we can play because every contract should have a designer. Um, the project must have been designed by an engineer, must have been supervised by an engineer. And there are management processes and uh, protocols respecting quality uh, controls and quality assurance and all those protocols that should have been observed where they observe where they not observed. Um, it, it is true. I think as an institution, although it's it is stretching ourselves a bit when we have to delve into that. And in major instances, for instance, when there was the Melcom disaster, for instance, when seven, 17 people lost their lives when the building collapsed in Achimota, the institution pro bono put together a team that uh, put together a report, you know, and submitted to government. And that's how far we can go. I mean, we, uh, for instance, the AMA, which is the, the metropolitan agency responsible for that, must have had a city engineer or a structural engineer or an engineer who signed up the, the drawing and whose stamp it was on and all that. If we, we do our initial investigations and we pass it on to government, or the agency responsible for it. We cannot move further than that, um, except to maybe do public advocacy. And it's not essentially that sometimes we won't do too much. But I, I understand and I get what, you, what, what you're saying. It's, it's an area that as an institution, we have to be seen do, being very frontal and advocating and also taking, um, and I do quite recollect when uh, the, the president was being, the current president, Engineer Alexei, um, in his inaugural statement, made that point um, that we would sanction our own if we, we think that some of our own members have behaved recklessly or not respected the code of ethics and as such have brought shame to our institution, then we'll have to take those actions. So, as I said, these are all beginning processes. We can do more, we should do more, and I want to assure you that the institution is capable of handling some of these things. Okay, thank you. The, 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 the president is here and he also wants to add his voice to us. Um, in the first place, um, we're, we're supposed to be um, participating in the activities of the institution. And if you do find out that the, uh, there is a problem, um, there has to be a complainant. And in the past, we had a situation where uh, a particular government institution, some engineers were accused of uh, not being ethically compliant. The report was made to the institution. That's why I said there had to be a complainant. 
report was made to the institution, it was referred to the ethics committee, and then those, those engineers were suspended in that their names were taken off the roll for some time. Uh, so this has happened, and this happened in the last, um, a few years ago. And so if this is, if you realize that um, government has been shortchanged because an engineer hasn't acted properly, you make a, a report to the institution and then we refer to the ethics committee and they go into the case. And once engineer has to be certified before he practices, if he's suspended, then it means that he cannot practice. And then, and then he may lose his position in his workplace. So again, I think the issue that you raised um, has come to the attention of the institution. And then when you complain, we'll, we'll take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, Sam do you have some concluding remarks? Uh, we want to end it here. I think, I think I... Well over yeah, I will take this opportunity to thank all of you for participating. And I am very thrilled with the engagement. And I'm hoping that the next module and future modules, we will see more participation. You know, you can talk to your friends about it, uh, what is going on. It's a huge thing, ethics. And I'm glad that we've taken the initiative to start looking at it. And I look forward to seeing you participating in the next module, which probably will be next week. Thank you. Well, so um, fellow colleagues, engineers who are on this platform on behalf of the council and president of the institution, uh, I want to thank all of you for participating. And as I said, these are difficult times for all of us in, in view of uh, the public health nightmare we are all experiencing currently. We hope that all of you stay safe. Uh, we know that a lot of our members are working very hard um, um, trying to keep the essential infrastructure working and in place in certain places. They are exposed to difficulties and we, we, we want to support and support all of you. So thank you very much for joining this. And uh, as I said, uh, we'll, we'll engage with you and send you correspondence to the next um, module and other. Uh, we are likely to have another um, discussion like this on emotional intelligence and other aspects of life that we think impacts on us as engineers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.